save your questions till later and please come back. So the first, uh, the, the, the first uh, territory we have, we're going to go alphabetically again, is American Samoa, who will be joining us virtually. Ima imagine that. <laughs> so carrying on uh, alphabetically, uh, we're going to start with CNMI, um, which is uh, on, my, on my right. Alfreda and, and Aaron. OK, so you have 10 minutes and I will be your cop. Be nice, OK? <laughs> the song. okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? OK. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alfreda Camacho Meritita, and I currently serve as a special assistant for public transportation for the Commonwealth Office of Trans Transit Authority under the CNMI Office of the Governor and supported by partners in the CNMI Built Environment Task Force. On behalf of the Honorable Governor Ralph de Leon Guerrero Torres and the CNMI delegation team that is present here today, I'm very grateful to be here to speak to you about the CNMI's Built Infrastructure Priority Project, and that is the Inner Island Multimodal Transportation Feasibility Study and Implementation. We have the wrong slides. Do we have Chris on now? Or just Chris's slides? Wing it. Okay. CODA has been working closely with the CNMI Office of Planning and Development in support of the Complete Streets Working Group. I'd like to introduce you to Aaron Darrington, lead planner for the Office of the uh, Planning and Development in the CNMI. And she'll be talking to you today about the interconnection between the CNMI Comprehensive Sustainable Plan and the built infrastructure priorities reflected by this project. This priority will benefit the CNMI, our Marianas, by strengthening our economic development increase our access to healthcare between the islands of Saipan, Tinian, and Rhoda, revive our tourism industry, and provide environmentally friendly technologies such as electric transit vehicles with charging stations, just to name a few. So why is this the CNMI's top priority for built infrastructure, you may wonder? Well, the CNMI is planning for complete multimodal transportation systems to support infrastructure and Commonwealth health outcomes. The CNMI has made great strides at building and expanding its surface transportation on the island of Saipan. However, there's still so much work to be done. An inner island multimodal transportation feasibility study and implementation projects such as this will allow the CNMI to explore different modes of transportation and connect our islands together and strengthen our recovery and resiliency through any challenge we may face. How do we plan on tackling this? Well, we've prepared a highlighted video to show you just how critical this priority project is for our islands and all the beneficial outcomes that will follow thereafter with the proper assessment, planning, and implementation. Please direct your attention to the screen. Thank you. Next slide, video please. Hi, sorry for the interruption. We have the video, but it's still downloading because it's really large. Um, so as soon as it's done, I can cue you um, and then we can play it at that moment. I think if they just advance to the next slide. It's in okay, let's just go on to the next slide and I'll have Erin come up and talk. Thank you. Thank you, Special Assistant Meritita, and thank you, OIA and partners. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here today. 
Uh, my name is Erin Darrington and I am the lead planner with the Office of Planning and Development, which is a planning collaboration agency that has worked closely with our partners in the Planning and Development Advisory Council, our Built Environment Task Force, and our Complete Streets Working Group, which includes CODA, the Commonwealth uh, Office of Transportation Authority, Department of Public Works, our Ports Authority, CUC, Bureau of Environmental Quality, and more. We are specialists in adaptive planning, and it looks like we do have a video ready to show you, yes. so I will tell you more <laughs> in just a moment. Uh, I thought the, uh, the services in the Vietnamese for the, the uh, 
people of Florida and the Commonwealth as a whole. Because the um, leaders become closer to each other and make us one millions. And that is really a good thing for the people of the Commonwealth. I would say the uh, East Bay of Rhoda, if you all go to uh, Song Song Village and you go drive east, that is the best uh, place for a terminal services because most of the time the, the water is calm at that bay. It will help the uh, economic development for the islands uh, amongst ourselves, tourism, and also having each and every one of us visit each other. Um, uh, in the in this Commonwealth, so the, the benefit is uh, it, there's a lot of benefit, really. Like I said earlier, it's a it's a need for us to move around and know each other more. Buffet day, Antiro, and Aloha, everyone. I ask uh, for your humble support uh, to please uh, help us bring in a ferry system here especially the open water ferry uh, that has uh, roll-on, roll-off for vehicles. Again, um, the opportunity for our locals, our residents to visit other islands like Tinian, Rhoda, and even up to the Northern Islands. Um, this will create additional uh, tourism sites, opportunity for economic growth, and uh, especially with Tinian, where military build up is on its way, to give our men and women the opportunity to again avail on the ferry to come to Saipan or to Rhoda um, and enjoy the islands um, within the Sinomai. So again, I support the ferry 100% and I hope to see this relationship foster and have an additional transportation here in Sinomai. Thank you and Susus Masi. Two minute warning. I can talk fast. <laughs> so you've heard from our leadership and our partners how important this critical investment in connecting our community is and will be to supporting comprehensive sustainable development goals that relate to our socioeconomic growth as well as our health priorities and more. This investment in programmatic connectivity will bring our communities together and help us build back better now and for the future. It aligns with the goals of our Complete Streets Task Force, which incorporates considerations of walkability, wellness, and revitalization planning into the project implementation prior priorities that have been identified here. It will further align with complementary Department of Public Works 20-year highway plans, our comprehensive economic development strategy priorities, ongoing primary and secondary road risk reduction projects, as well as CPA, the Ports Authorities, Port Airport Enhancements, and CHCC's expansion efforts to address our community's pressing well-being goals as well. And I'd like to thank CHCC, who's uh, represented in the room as well, and all of our partners for this tremendous support that they've been providing to this collaborative effort to enhance critical systems redundancy through this pilot project, which will align with and magnify our complementary comprehensive sustainable development growth priorities. So with that, the CNMI thanks you all for your time, for your support. And on the next slide, you just have some contact information and a reflection of our many uh, PDAC, Planning and Development Advisory Council members. Uh, and <coughs> numerous agencies are not reflected in that uh, slide, but just thank you again. We look forward to the ongoing conversation to amplifying CNMI's needs as part of the BIL effort and more. So, just messy. Okay, thank you very much to the Commonwealth. Um, do we have American Samoa on at this point? Okay, let's take it away, Samoa. Mm -hmm. This is the built infrastructure portion. Um, 
I'm sure that you'll all be interested to sit in on the next session, which is the broadband. <laughs> hey, Don, um, it seems we just lost Director King again. If we could move to Guam next. Okay. Uh, next, uh, speaking for Guam is uh, Melody Mendiola from uh, the Guam Economic Development Authority. Thank you, Melody. Hafadeng, good afternoon, everyone. Can I get a hand raise from all my brothers and sisters from Guam joining me today? Come on, Guam. Look at all the numbers, and we couldn't do a video? We're a bigger island than these guys. We got more people than these guys. All right. Much love to my brothers and sisters from the Northern Marianas. In fact, Mendiola, my last name, is of Luta descent. That's my family. So very, very happy to be among, among peers and colleagues uh, to talk to you today about the Guam Medical Campus um, conceptual plan. So Governor Leon Guerrero, next slide. Um, Governor Leon Guerrero, uh, whose background, in fact, is a nurse. Um, so she was a nurse before she became a politician, as well as a former president of a bank. She's got a wide um, a very broad skill set, um, but her vision was to create um, a medical campus. Um, just to give you a little bit of situational awareness, the government of Guam, um, the Guam Memorial Hospital was assessed in 2019 for both a repair and a replacement by the Army Corps of Engineers. Which one do you think was cheaper, the repair or the replacement? It was cheaper to replace altogether than to repair our ailing Guam Medical, um, our uh, Guam Memorial Hospital. In addition, our Department of Public Health and Social Services um, headquarters uh, suffered a fire. And so uh, we in bad shape, Guam, okay, um, as far as the delivery of our medical services. Now, can you imagine not only for the people of Guam, but for our neighbors that come to Guam for medical services from the Northern Marianas, as well as um, the Federated States of Micronesia, um, these challenges became something that the governor uh, said that this was her mission, this was her calling to deliver to Guam um, the future of healthcare in Micronesia. Next slide. <clears throat> she said, our goal is to develop a medical campus that meets our community's urgent needs. This facility is being designed for all and will continue to work together and bring everyone along towards a healthy and prosperous um, future for Guam. So if we can skip the next slide, which is just a title slide and then go to the next one. The Governor, Governor Leon Guerrero involved many different stakeholders, as you can see, the Guam Memorial Hospital, the Department of Public Health, Guam Behavioral, the Veterans Administration, the University of Guam, Guam Community College, the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission, GURA, DISID, that says uh, Integrated Services for Individuals with Disabilities, the Department of Public Works, the Build-Up Office, and the Guam Economic Development Authority. Um, in addition, there were uh, on the other side of these, these were the government agencies involved in the process of planning. In her medical task force, uh, the governor also, uh, we work with the Department of the Navy with private architects and engineers who serve in an advisory capacity, medical professionals, so our doctors and health uh, private clinics. Um, original landowners, so the sites, uh, one of the potential sites um, is in fact, um, it was once upon a time historically owned um, by native Ch uh, Chamorros. Uh, Guam, Guam Memorial Hospital Volunteers Association and other nonprofits who serve uh, the community that we're serving. Next slide. Actually, let's go ahead and skip to the red slide. That's one more, yeah, that's it. So really what the, um, what the medical campus, what the governor's goal for this medical campus was all about accessibility for all. And so Guam currently is served by the Guam Memorial Hospital, in addition to the Guam Regional Medical um, City uh, Private Hospital. Both hospitals are located on uh, the western, sort of the northwest portion of the island. They do serve the vast majority, the, the concentrated um, areas of population for our island. However, once you start to go south, um, south of our island, they're not quite served as well, at least not within a short period of time, 30 minutes or less. And that's something that the governor wanted us to achieve as a major priority. Um, so, so as you can see, the very dark red is, um, is uh, areas that can be served by the hospital within 10 minutes and all the way to the lighter pink um, within 30 minutes. And that stretches down to the southern portion of the island and across the southern portion of the island through uh, to where the Navy base is. Um, and so accessibility for all was a significant focus. 
the medical campus composition, it's more than just the Guam Memorial Hospital. The medical campus is made up of the Guam Memorial Hospital, of, of course, the Department of Public Health and Social Services, Behavioral Health and Wellness. Uh, the governor is very intent also on accommodating our veterans with a Veterans Administration medical facility. And um, of course, you would imagine when you have this many uh, government buildings, you can have some shared services, including a lab, administrative offices, a pharmacy or pharmacies, a helipad, and uh, a campus utility type of complex. In addition, um, broadband, uh, data, a broadband, a medical or regional data center. And what would be great about this is um, instead of in not a medical, not a place just to house the servers for our medical, our healthcare infrastructure, but government-wide um, servers. And um, and so this is and and uh, data center in general. There's also a planned emergency preparedness warehouse expeditionary medical facility capabilities, assisted living facilities, and a number of future growth um, opportunities, including um, a private, uh, the, uh, the ability to put up private clinics ar around this uh, government's go government facility, right? And so really the importance of this medical campus is it's, it's, opening, um, it's opening up a part of Guam that is currently uh, economically underserved to some extent. Right now, our industries are uh, military, tourism, and those are all concentrated in the Tuman area, Hagatnya area, and north. And this starts to bring industry, including healthcare, a little bit more central and a little southern to our island and all the associated jobs. As many of you are aware, healthcare is this, uh, was the healthcare and technology, the two leading creators of jobs across America. And of course, with the recent pandemic, healthcare has probably inching forward and saying, you know, that's probably the highest I would, I would imagine, creating the most jobs. Now in our region, our region is historically, I think I say, speak for all my brothers and sisters in Micronesia when I say that um, our region is historically underserved. Um, and that is for many reasons. One of them is the remoteness of our islands. But creating a medical campus like this um, helps to address how underserved we are in a, and do it in an integrated fashion where we can do it. Um, we can also incorporate um, our University of Guam and Guam Community College and their associated resources to build capacity in this area in the region. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so let's get down to the brass tacks on land and infrastructure, right? Because that's why we're here. Okay, so the next slide. As far as accessibility, um, there is a two, now this is a side street. We really wanted to make it look dramatic. There is an actual two lane street in front of where the potential medical campus is. It's only two lanes though. We need five. And um, so this, uh, the, the main site currently identified is off the Guam uh, uh, Route 15. We also have an access, um, uh, a potential access at route, route 10. So there's two ways to access the current, um, this proposed site for the medical campus. Um, other site considerations, we'd like to continue to accommodate athletic fields, which is the current, uh, current use of the site, um, and, uh, and locate utilities on site. Let's go ahead and skip down uh, to the, let's see, two slides. Yep, there we go. So here's a nice conceptual plan where you see the parking facility, you see the various facilities, and you see the, the original athletic fields that are left off to the right. And we have some potential example photos in the next slide of what this could look like. Isn't that pretty? Don't you want to see that in Guam? <laughs> All right. Utilities. So um, their GPA proposes building, the Guam Power Authority proposes building a power substation. Um, we require one acre for infrastructure. You can go to the next slide. And it looks like this will be a three-year project um, for about $20 million. You go to the next slide. DPW, the Department of Parks and uh, Department of Public Works, um, is looking at widening Route 15, the main access to the medical campus, as well as installing some traffic controls. And the next, uh, the next couple slides. If we go down to the water estimates, we have some well design and exploration, um, additional, basically increasing our water capacity and our wastewater capacity as well. If you see two slides after that, and then let's see. Actually, in the interest of time, let's go all the way down to summary infrastructure costs, which is slide number 23, and I promise I'm right after. Summary infrastructure costs, we believe uh, infrastructure alone will be $135 million. This hospital, uh, the medical campus, is expected to uh, amount to close to $1 billion or $1.1 billion. Um, so lastly, I, t I leave with you the challenges. If we can go down to the 
two slides, three slides after that. There we go. Of course, funding is always a challenge. Uh, the funding is expected to come from multiple places. We have general funding that uh, our, our general funds and our general operations that should cover a uh, lion's share of this. In addition, we also are utilizing some ARP um, specific to this. Um, labor continues to be an, an issue as well as the cost of materials. Guam utilizes um, H2B visa labor, which is foreign uh, labor. We ask for carve outs. When it comes to that, we would very much like to train up our local for workforce, and we have been doing that. Having said that, this is, these are many of these are temporary shocks to our work supply, uh, that a carve-out would be exceptionally um, beneficial to get this done in a timely manner. Lastly, materials costs. Um, the cost of buy American, unfortunately, we very much like to buy American. We have no issues with that, but the cost of shipping makes it very prohibitive. We're much closer to Asia. Guam is a three-hour flight to the Philippines, and uh, whereas uh, Hawaii is an eight-hour flight. And I leave you with this. Right now, all the residents of Guam and Micronesia, we fly to the Philippines and uh, potentially Taiwan for medical treatment. We'd very much like to be able to serve our people on American soil with American doctors. And um, so some of the short-term sacrifices we need to make when it comes to labor and it comes to materials are things that can we be recovered uh, in the long term with a long-term um, benefit to our healthcare system and a regional healthcare system. And uh, so with that, I thank you all for your attention after lunch and I wish you all a pleasant rest of conference. Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, how are we doing with American Samoa? Mm -hmm. Let's let's go to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Kai Smith on my um, on my left. Um, I think most places. Hi, hi, Don. Yes. Sorry, um, Chris King is ready from American Samoa. If we could. Oh, Kai, <laughs> apologize sorry. about the Don't order. Go far. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, save the best for last. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris King, American Samoa. Talofa, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about the, the little mix up. I was going off of Samoan time. All right, so it was good afternoon, Talofa from American Samoa. I'm Chris King, Director of uh, Department of Port Administration. My department handles both the airports and seaports here in American Samoa. Uh, I'll be presenting on the territory's infrastructure priority projects that focus on shoreline protection which is a combination of projects between my department and public works. Okay, so this is what I'll be covering uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll be going over project locations. I'll go over the shoreline inventory that was done by public works, uh, then move on to pro project objectives, which really sets uh, everything in motion. You'll get to see the different projects which are at the top of our priority list. And finally, I'll wrap things up by reviewing the challenges we expect to face. So for those that are not familiar with American Samoa, we are dead center in this map, uh, right in the middle of all that blue ocean. We are so small, we don't even get a dot on the map, but trust me, we are right here, right? Now, <laughs> Now, um, I don't feel so bad because Saipan and Guam don't have dots either, yet here they are. Uh, I understand that they're making up for not having a dot on the map by being there in the conference in person with something like 100 strong uh, compared to our one. Uh, Lisa, hi Lisa, just a shout out to you. So, a lot of Guam and Saipan, but um, all kidding aside, I did um, I did want to mention that I was happy to hear from um, in this opening session uh, from both uh, Ms. Sierra Zorita of the President's Office and um, DOI <coughs> Senior Advisor Ms. Uh, Stockelberg of their pledge and commitment to do better for us territories and communities that are often underserved, where uh, equity uh, has a lot to be desired. Um, mainly because we are marginalized and uh, affected by several factors like poverty and, of course, uh, location um, with no dot on the map. But uh, we're, it looks like we're off to a good start and um, we're moving up in the world and eventually we'll get that dot in the map. So uh, thank you. All right. Okay. So actually, when we zoom in really, really close, 
uh, we are below the equator and right up against the international dateline that separates us from our sister islands uh, of Samoa, uh, where they're the same race, uh, same people, same language, same food, even the same families, but they're a totally different country. Uh, anyways, you can see uh, along the edges of the map just how far everyone is from American Samoa. Um, Guam just mentioned it's an eight hour flight from Guam to Hawaii. Well, for us, it's a five hour flight. Um, so anyways, our shoreline projects are focused on American Samoa's main island of Tutuila that you see right there in the middle of the map and Ofu Island, which is 60 miles to the west or east. I'm sorry, east. OK, American Samoa is made up of five volcanic islands and two atolls <clears throat> with a total land mass of 76 square miles. Tutuila is the main island, which has the largest land mass of 52 square miles. Then there's Aonu'u, Ta'u, Ofu, and Olusenga in Manua. And finally, the atolls of Swains and the bird sanctuary, Rose Island. The volcanic terrain provides very limited and narrow coast uh, plains with an interior chain of mountains that stretches the length of the island. Now, because of that steep uh, terrain, the majority of the roads are on the coast, all of which are subject to erosion and rising sea levels. So here's another fun fact. There is only 150 miles of road in American Samoa. In comparison, uh, that's only half the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. So to measure the extent of the impact on our coastal roads, in 2006, the Army Corps of Engineers and Public Works conducted an inventory of the shorelines. This project was made possible through the Fed Aid and Federal Highway Program. The study provided assessments on the shoreline conditions and placed them into three categories to describe the situation, critical, potentially critical, and non-critical. The little red boxes on those maps indicate the inventory sites here on Tutuila, where the bulk of the American Samoa roads are on. And here are the inventory sites on Aonu'u, Ofu, Olusenga, and Tu'u Islands. So these tables uh, right here represent the data sets from the shoreline inventory that I just showed you on the previous slides. But what does all this mean? Well, here's the same data in another format, and it's just easier to digest. In a nutshell, of the 150 miles of roads in American Samoa, there are 60 miles of shoreline. Of those 60 miles, 30% or roughly 20 miles were identified as being critical and potentially critical and in the need of mitigation. Um, yes, this uh, inventory report was uh, conducted 16 years ago, However, if you take into account sea level rise and the number of storms since then, it is possible that the non-critical shorelines have experienced some level of erosion and have now added additional miles of shoreline to the potentially critical and even critical categories. Here's our project objectives uh, to protect our infrastructure from erosion, rising sea levels, storm surges, and inundation. Minimize transportation risk, which will improve movement reliability on our roads and protect our homes. Uh, the picture here at the bottom, well, the pictures here uh, show the damages on a, row, a section of road in Ofu caused by tropical cyclone Heta in, the late, uh, in late 2003. Uh, notice uh, how the waves just undermine the entire foundation of, of that road. Um, so here's uh, Ofu Airport. Uh, another one of our priority projects in need of shoreline mitigation right here. The approach end of the runway is just 10 feet away from the shoreline and the erosion has already encroached into the runway safety area, which is not a good thing, right? So um, here's a close up of that area. You can see the displaced rocks from the old revetment. Uh, the project is roughly 550 linear feet with a cost of 2.5 million. Now, Here's the opposite side of the runway where we actually have a shoreline uh, protection uh, with a riprap system uh, shown right here. Now I do want to mention that about two weeks ago, we just signed a grant agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers to do a feasibility study for this particular project. 
So I do want to give a uh, hearty thank you to the Army Corps of Engineers uh, Deputy Director Jeff Herzog and Project Manager Cindy Akpal. If you're there in the conference, Faftai uh, Telelava. Now here's our shoreline project connecting Ofu Wharf to the Ofu Airport. This project mitigates 7,200 linear feet of unprotected road, costing about 17.4 million. Here you can get an idea of the coastline road that connects the seaport to the airport and then onto the bridge that, and, uh, that connects Ofu and Olusenga. The emphasis of this project really is on the bridge connecting Ofu to Olusenga and the need to beef up that shoreline um, uh, support uh, right here in the picture, right on that side of the bridge. Got two minutes left, Chris. Okay, so shifting um, our focus to Tutuila Island, here's the central area in need of attention. Again, the aim is to harden the critical shoreline areas connecting the airport and seaport. So starting from the airport, here is the hot spot in need of mitigation right there. Um, this is the shoreline adjacent runway 826, and it also runs along the Pala Lagoon. The objectives here are the same, protect the runway, just like at Ofu Airport. There's just a lot more of it and worth 25 million. Here's a closer view. Uh, the design is about 80% complete, but still requires additional environmental assessments. I also wanted to mention that the Apollo Lagoon site also converges with other jurisdictions, so there is definitely room for collaboration with other departments uh, regarding the sharing of resources. Now, as we continue down the road towards the seaport, we reach this area where the shoreline protection is especially crucial uh, because this is the sole route uh, from the east and the west to our island's only hospital right there. And it will also protect an elementary school as well. Moving to the east, we have a vital stretch of shoreline that connects to Awasi Harbor, uh, which is the launching point to and from our new uh, island. It's about 28,000 linear feet, costing 48.5 million. And on the west side, uh, there's close to 9,500 linear feet in need of shoreline protection costing 16 million, and you'll note the clusters of communities along the route uh, in need of protection as well. So to wrap things up, there are a few challenges that we anticipate of note funding um, because these, these projects are all large ticket items. And then we have the access to technical assistance, so we're planning on more collaboration with the Army Corps uh, for this as well as the permitting processes as well. Um, here's one of the challenges. Um, it's uh, this is a great example of identifying the most effective methodology. It's the same bridge, but different protection. Tribar on the Ofu side and riprap on uh, the Olasenga side. So, which one, one is, is more uh, more effective? Right. Uh, I just wanted to end with another picture of the effects of storm surge, which doesn't just impact our roads, but our waterfront facilities as well. As you can see, it deposited some really large rocks on the dock, right? And that's there in Falesau Harbor in Manila. So with that, uh, I thank you for your time and uh, thank you DOI for allowing American Samoa to present. Um, I guess I'll be able to answer any questions, more, most likely in the Q&A section, if I'm not mistaken, or during the breakout session for American Samoa. And with that, I'll now turn the floor back to our session moderator, Faftai and uh, Soifua. Thank you very much, Chris. Another great presentation from a, a place that, that has a, a bit of work that they, they can use. Um, next up, we've got uh, U.S. Virgin Islands again. <laughs> Kai Smith. And good afternoon to those in attendance, both virtually and here with us in person today. My name is Kai Smith. I'm the senior engineer of the St. Thomas, St. John District of the Virgin Islands Port Authority. 
and I'm pleased to be here with you today to present a brief overview of our terminal expansion programs, both on at the Cyril E. King Airport at St. Thomas and the Henry E. Rosen Airport on St. Croix, both of which we are actively seeking funding opportunities and both which are already in the design process. Next slide, please. Next slide. That's just a little fact sheet on the Cyril E. King Airport. Um, the Virgin Islands Port Authority's expansion program's main effort is to use an innovative approach to enhance passenger experience and overall facility functionality. The Virgin Islands Port Authority, or VIPA as we call its goal, is to establish St. Thomas and St. Croix as premier destinations of choice of the Caribbean and to capitalize on the inherent benefits as a tourist destination in the Caribbean. We share similar challenges of other small islands of being effectively landlocked. So in response, our expansion program both tries to, tries to utilize the existing passenger terminal footprints, building and expanding vertically to the extent possible to achieve our goals. Next slide, please. The Cyril E. King Airport was constructed in November 1990, and at the time it was designed for an estimated 300,000 passengers annually. Viper now experiences employments on the order of 740,000 passengers annually, and based on forecasts completed as a part of the authority's master plan, employments are expected to grow to 840,000 by 2035. It's not a bad thing, Tourism is growing, but our facility is literally bursting at the seams. Next slide. Phase one of this terminal expansion program has already begun. Viper is in the process of building a state-of-the-art post-tension. Oh, actually, can you take it back one slide? Sorry. Viper is in the process of building a state-of-the-art post-tension parking and transportation facility. The project will provide 319 parking spaces and offices for rental car operations. Funding for this project was provided by an EDA grant in the amount of $20 million, with a local match of $6.8 million and is expected to be completed in the summer of 2023. Next slide. Phases two through four of the Cyril E. King terminal expansion starts with the development of the second floor of the existing terminal building. The second floor will host the relocated passenger hall rooms, 10 in total, and will have commercial and retail areas. Next slide, please. Additionally, 10 new passenger boarding bridges will be installed, each one of the 10 new hold rooms, which will extend out of the second floor at an elevation of 16 feet above ground. Each PBB will be a three tunnel configuration equipped with preconditioned air, 400 Hertz ground power units, and a building management system which will connect to the new terminal facility. Next slide, please. Each of the whole rooms will be approximately 3,000 square feet with seating for about 75% of the aircraft passenger capacity. The new commercial and retail areas will be approximately 25,000 square feet in total and the common areas which include hallways, bathroom and other passenger amenities will be approximately 29,000 square feet. To allow the construction of the second floor, the existing roof will be removed and replaced with a concrete slab on top of a new metal web joist system. This will be done in sequential phasing to allow for terminal operations to continue. The new roof will also include a new skylight system, which will have approximately 142,000 square feet. The second floor development will also include the addition of a curtain glass wall wrapping around the terminal, the wall will have an average height of 16 feet and the span will be approximately 1700 linear feet and will be designed to resist hurricane force winds and comply with the most stringent code requirements to ensure safety and durability. Next slide, please. To accomplish the separation of passenger flows, the existing bag makeup area will be relocated to a new constructed bag makeup addition to the east of the terminal. The new addition will include new baggage belts and incorporate better utilization of the existing explosive detection screening equipment or EDS equipment. The two separate baggage handling system belts allowing outbound luggage processing to function more efficiently and therefore reduce handling time. 
The original baggage makeup area will then be renovated to provide new additional CBP and TSA screening facility for U.S. and Puerto Rico outbound passengers. The relocation of the current U.S. Puerto Rico screening and queuing areas to this new processing facility will provide additional space in the previous locations. Next slide, please. In addition to the proposed renovation, the terminal's existing fire protection system will be reconfigured and brought up to standards and will include a new second floor level with an open sprinkler system. The HVAC systems will be completely new and properly sized for the peak hours of the terminal operation. A new second floor plumbing, potable water, and sewer system will be installed to service restaurants, commercial, and retail spaces. The electrical power will be reconfigured to allow the new power demands for the redevelopment of the second floor. The airport expansion concludes with the construction of a new structurally independent commuter wing to accommodate inter-island travel. When the expansion is complete, this area will be able to accommodate international travel from neighboring islands. Overall, phases two through four of the Cyril E. King Airport expansion are shovel ready and are estimated to cost around $350 million, but can be broken down into smaller phases subject to availability yep. of funding. Next slide, please. Uh, We're gonna move uh, on to hey, 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 is this Joe? expansion on C4. <laughs> hey, uh, my friend Joe. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the number and it says uh, it's Lisa's December office. And like, one. Health and Lisa's office is calling me at this point. So million dollars. Should be online right now. Local <laughs> was funded by an EDA grant. Also, I know, I know, I know. I heard you guys. Uh, you guys are like a hundred strong. It's currently in design. It will provide an expanded whole room on the second floor of the terminal, with additional concession space and allow for the loading and unloading of different aircraft simultaneously by way of four passenger boarding bridges, moving the U.S. slash Puerto Rico hold room to the second floor allows for more efficient flow of the terminal by consolidating the large air traffic carriers on the second floor lounge. Next slide, please. The newly constructed whole room on the first floor will continue to operate to serve commuter traffic on an interim basis and eventually be converted to international arrivals processing area for large charter and scheduled aircraft ar arriving from Europe and Asia. Construction of this phase will cause minimal impact to terminal um, operations during construction since the lower level will still be able to accommodate passenger processing. Two minutes. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just shows that out of phase two, it can be broken down into smaller sub phases, 2A and 2B, each consisting of two passenger boarding bridges each. Um, next slide, please. And that, that's phase 2B, which will be at another two additional jet bridges. Next slide, please. And that's just an overall um, overview of how it would look at the completion. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank everyone for this opportunity to make this brief presentation and for the chance to make VIPA's vision a reality. And as a military member, I'd like to proudly say that we can say goodbye to the days where disabled veterans would have to wait on a plane for special equipment just to take them off of their flights in the Virgin Islands. Thank you and I'll be available for any questions in the breakout session. Thank you very much, Kai. Um, at this point, what we'd like to do is we'd like to switch the territories and Commonwealth and um, bring up the federal partners for the built infrastructure group. Um, while we're doing that switch, uh, I think what's obvious here is, is that each of the presenters have put a lot of time and effort into um, these projects. They're, they're important projects. They're not the only infrastructure projects they have. They, they tried to uh, uh, pack everything they could into one. Um, and what you know, another thing that's quite obvious is that the infrastructure needs of, of these different islands, even though they're all islands, are quite different. We have everything from ferries to airports to roads. Uh, so, as as should be expected, um, 
there's a lot of differences in, in the, uh, the territories. Um, and with that, uh, we'll be going uh, alphabetically again. Um, we'll be starting off with the Department of Transportation. Uh, Federal Highways will go first. And that is, if you could introduce yourself too. I'm Gabrielle Gersh. I'm a transportation engineer overseeing the territories with the Federal Highway Administration out of the Honolulu Division Office. And I'm going to go over a brief overview of the existing program and how the bipartisan infrastructure law changed some of it. Next slide, please. After the law was passed, or the bill was passed, Federal Highways established a number of goals that we want to see accomplished with the money, including improving safety for road users, improving the conditions of the bridge, of bridge assets, promoting sustainability and increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change, and reconnecting communities and disadvantaged um, that were historically disadvantaged. Next slide, please. There are a number of programs overseen by the Federal Highway Administration to grant money to the territories. The main one is the Territorial Highway Program, which is an annual allocation that awards each territory a certain percentage. The other three grants that were established in the bill I'll be discussing as well. Please continue. So Federal Highways and the Departments of Public Works have a pretty close relationship. We oversee the programs through our stewardship and oversight agreement where we both approve um, program approved projects and provide technical assistance. The Pacific Territories are overseen out of the Honolulu office and Virgin Islands is overseen out of the Federal Highways office in Puerto Rico. Next, please. So the Territorial Highway Program, like I said, is the main source of funding. It's an annual allocation to improve roads and bridges on routes that are designated within each territory. The previous levels were established under the FAST Act and the FAST Act extension, and the bill provided an increase in funding over the five years um, to, until it tops out at 2026. Each territory receives a percentage of the overall territorial highway funding pot, 10% um, to American Samoa and CNMI, 40% to Guam and U.S. Virgin Islands. The percentages were not changed in the bill. Next, please. This is a chart of the increase over the five years. As you can see on the left side, that was the existing or the previous levels of funding under the FAST Act extension with a total of 42 million. Over the five years, there's a gradual increase until we reach 50 million for the overall territorial highway program. And then each territory's percentage of that is shown in the breakdown. Next slide. So the first grant I'm going to touch on is a grant for charging and fueling infrastructure. It's a new program under the bill and the goal is to deploy publicly accessible vehicle charging infrastructure along alternative fuel corridors. We're aiming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and then fill in gaps to pre publicly accessible vehicle charging infrastructure. The maximum grant allowance for a project is 15 million and the federal share of that cannot exceed 80 million, uh, sorry, cannot exceed 80%. Next slide, please. In order to apply for this grant, we need to have an established alternative fuel corridor. We've, Federal Highways reviews those corridors about once every year, and a corridor is comprised of at least two stations. The 2022 nominations for a corridor are due May 13th, and you can see our website has more information on that. In this grant, you can cost share with a private entity to install charging infrastructure, such as like electrical vehicle charging stations, and the revenue from such a cost sharing agreement can be used in that project. Next slide, please. The second grant I'm gonna to touch on is the National Infrastructure Project Assistance, which the Federal Highway Administration is calling the Mega Project Grant. It's also a new program established in the bill and aims to limit greenhouse gas emissions, address climate change issues, address environmental justice, especially for disadvantaged communities, and proactively address equity and barriers to opportunity. Next slide, please. So nationwide, there's $5 billion for the mega, mega project program for all five fiscal years. It's about $1 billion every year. The grants can cover 60% of total eligible project costs, the federal share of which is 80%. It can be a multi or single year project. So when you apply, you can either apply for a project to be completed in the one year or over a number of years. The notice of funding opportunity or NOFO was sent out 
last week and is due in, towards the end of May. Next slide, please. The last grant project, uh, the last grant I'm going to touch on is the Local and Regional Project Assistance Grant, which the Federal Highway Administration calls the RAISE grant. It's a continuation of existing program, but the bill expanded eligibility so that the territories are eligible. The eligible project has to improve safety, improve environmental sustainability, improve quality of life, and contribute to a good state of repair for your infrastructure. Next slide, please. Under this, there's a minimum threshold for projects for rural communities, which all of the territories are. The minimum is at least $1 million. The project limit is $25 million. The federal share is limited to 80%, but you can apply for an exception for, to be granted at a higher percentage than that. The NOFO was sent out earlier this month and is due in the middle of April in a couple of weeks. Next slide. Well, that's it. That's all the programs. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was. Uh very good. <laughs> okay, next uh, next up will be uh, FAA, Mark McClarty. As I walk up to a thunderous applause. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so let me start by saying to our partners in CMNI and Guam, half a day, to our partners from America, Samoa, you're not just a map, down in the ocean, by the way, Talofa. Talofa, there you go. <laughs> to our federal partners here and some of our guests from Hawaii, aloha. And to our partners from the Virgin Islands and from the US mainland, welcome. Thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Mark McClarity. I'm the director for the Office of Airports Western Pacific Region. I'm based in Los Angeles. And um, we have an office in Honolulu that works directly with the uh, islands in the Pacific. and uh, one of my counterparts, some of you know, in, in Virgin Islands, Stephen Hicks in the Southern region, they're on virtually. So they're going to assist in the Q&A sessions in the cafe. And then Robin Hunt, she's out of DC. She's um, she's our bill guru. <laughs> she's on virtually as well. So there's no hook here. I can talk. No one's going to pull me off, um, but they're here to kind of correct everything I say. Um, so let's get started. Next slide, please. You've heard this before. This is a once in a generation opportunity. And there's some really good stuff in here. And we're really, really happy because while all transportation is important, for us aviation is what gets you off the you know off the island when you're in an island and gets visitors on the island. So we really want to work with everybody to make sure we have world class transportation, air transportation. So it's a five-year, $25 billion investment in the nation's air, air traffic system. And I'm going to talk about it in three buckets, about $5 billion for uh, air traffic facilities. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. About $15 billion for airport infrastructure. And then the third bucket, which we're getting a little bit deeper in, is going to be uh, for airport terminals and also for airport-owned control towers. Uh, next slide, please. So let me start with the uh, air traffic facilities bucket. Um, for the first year, it's about a $1 billion investment. Uh, we expect that to fall pretty much every year for five years. And we kind of look at it as a down payment to address the aging um, facilities that are out there for federally owned towers. Uh, this is really important uh, because this money was well needed. So we're happy that we're gonna be able to kind of work on some of these facilities uh, nationwide. Um, focus is going to be on looking at sustainment, uh, ways to sustain the systems, sustain the towers, um, reducing backlog, maintenance, re refurbishments, um, upgrades, replacement of critical uh, facilities. Uh, it's going to start with um, a, a, a study or focus on looking at the power, water, and air requirements. And from that, we expect years two to five to really build up um, once that analysis is done. So this is going to be an opportunity to really provide some much needed money into some of the aging uh, federally owned towers. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So this bucket 
is the uh, Airport Infrastructure Grant Program, about $15 billion. So a little bit about it, you can see from the slide here. Um, about 2.4 billion, a little bit under 2.4 billion. Um, it's gonna go towards primary airports and that's gonna be based on apportionment similar to what happens under the Airport Improvement Program. And we're anticipating the range of entitlements are gonna be somewhere between 1 million to 92.5 million, depending on um, what size airport it is and what the operations and activity level is. And then there's about 500 million a year for non-primary airports, including general aviation. And it really kind of depends on kind of how you're classified if you fall in one of those categories. Um, for airports that are general aviation airports and non-primary airports that are classified by the FAA as national, about $763,000 will be an entitlement. For those classified as regional, $295,000. For those classified as local, about $159,000. And for those classified as basic, about 110,000. Another really important thing is about $20 million a year uh, that's going towards federal uh, air traffic facilities, contract towers, as many of you could refer to it. Um, this is really important because, as some of you know, some a lot of a lot of the territories have federal towers, and this this allows us to use some of this money towards the refurbishment. Um, and replacement or construction of those type of facilities. It's going to be this $20 million that's allocated is not based on formula. And it's going to be a very competitive process. Uh, as you can expect, but but the, about 157 towers, we think is going to be eligible. And it would be 100% financing, whereas the other grants um, under this bucket are going to have the same percentage formulas that AIP has. Um, so somewhere between, depending on where you are, between 95 percent ish to about 75 percent, depending on the size and activity levels. So uh, we're pretty excited about this because we think this is going to make a big difference. And then about three three percent of this money is going to be available for FAA administrative expenses because this is going to be an extra workload on us to manage it. But for that small percent, uh, we think there's going to be a lot um, of benefit coming from it. So we can go to the next slide, please. So just more of a breakdown for what this means to you. Again, this is the these are the, the formulas, and you can see American Samoa. It's about 1.3 million roughly. Uh, CMNI a little bit over 6 million. Guam about 6.4 million roughly. Uh, you can see it on the screen as well. And then Virgin Islands about 6 million. And as I mentioned again, about 20 million is going to be a, available for competitive purposes looking at um, federal contract towers. So we'll go to the next slide please. Um, if you haven't looked at this yet, I really encourage you to look at it. Uh, FAA has a website, uh, a bipartisan infrastructure website, and it has an interactive map which lists funding by states and individual airports. So you can actually go back on this website and you can kind of look and see what type of entitlements um, you can expect. So we're very proud of this map, this, this interactive map. Okay, we'll go to the next one, please. And this takes us to the third bucket. Um, this is the airport terminal uh, program bucket. And unlike um, airport infrastructure grants, this is not formula based. This is gonna be competitive. And this funding is available for air, airport towers and airport owned uh, air traffic control towers. I'm sorry, airport terminals. I'm sorry, I said airport towers. Airport terminals and airport owned air traffic control towers. So there's some selection criteria that was established. Um, and you can see on here, it's basically improving the airfield uh, safety through terminal relocation, uh, replace agent facilities, increase capacity and passenger access, encourage competition, improve energy efficiency, uh, expand access to access for persons with disability and improving airport access for historically disadvantaged populations. So there's a lot of good things that's coming from this money that's going to help you address some of these needs and some of the challenges that you face in these categories. Um, we expect about 221 airports to be eligible for this competitive funding. 
and I, I love it when you get a new program. Um, so you heard no folk mentioned earlier, notice of funding opportunity. We're getting used to saying that. <laughs> so the no for uh, the $5 billion airport terminal project program rather um, was issued February 22nd and it closes today at 5 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> Everybody got their request in, right? <laughs> so that's for this year's this year's program. But um, this is kind of how it's going to kind of work itself out. It's, there's going to be no folks going out and then if you, everyone has a chance for these competitive um, processes to kind of compete. I guess my recommendation would be um, if you have aviation needs, uh, work with your local or regional uh, airports organization within the FAA. And we certainly will help try to help steer you towards the right direction to make you as competitive as you can be um, where funds are competitive. And with that, I want to close this up and make myself available for the cafe. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. We're almost right on time. We're doing good. <laughs> so uh, next is the, the Department of Transportation Federal Transit Authority. Administration. Ah. Uh, Bernardo Bustamante. Bustamante? Bustamante. Thank you, Bernardo. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting uh, the Federal Transit Administration to this uh, wonderful workshop. I want to acknowledge uh, all the Pacific Territories, uh, Virgin Islands, uh, federal partners. Uh, before I get started, just a little bit of who we are in the sense that we are uh, located, I guess we are based out of the San Francisco office. We are uh, region, so this is, we are part of the region nine and we cover obviously the Pacific territories, California, Hawaii, Arizona, and Nevada. And over the last couple of years, uh, we saw the need to provide more local technical assistance. So with our sister agency, Federal Highways, we were able to have a staff member co-located with the federal office in Hawaii. So I want to acknowledge uh, Ryan Fihi over there. He will be your point of contact for all the FTA pro programs uh, moving forward. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm, I'm Bernardo Bustamante, like I said, I'm the director of the Office of Program Management. So, so as you can see from the other federal presentations, uh, this is our one time uh, huge uh, infrastructure bill. So to put things in perspective, as it relates to the federal transit programs, as you can see on the slide, we are probably one of the biggest winners in the sense that we are getting a huge uh, amount of, of funding. As you can see on the left of the slide, uh, just to give you a flavor from a nationwide perspective, some of the uh, increases in federal funding for the different programs. And the federal transit program is a takeaway from the Highway Trust Fund. What I want, what I want you to pay attention is on the right side of the, of the slide. Those are the brand new uh, FTA programs moving forward. And I guess for you in particular, probably the last two uh, will be uh, of importance. Uh, the electric or low emitting ferry pilot program. And the last one, the ferry service for rural communities. And by definition, you guys are you know, part of the rural communities. Those two, I won't talk too much about it because we are in the process of developing the criteria. And hopefully that will be announced through a no for a funding opportunity uh, in the next probably sometime in May or so. And then we'll get the applications and hopefully by late summer uh, we'll be able to, to, re to release the information and, and get those applications from you. But let's move on with the other programs that we'd like to discuss. Again, just to give you a flavor from our national perspective, over the last five, ten years, Nationwide, we used to get about $12 billion nationwide. And as you can see, uh, because of this bill, uh, FTA program basically doubled nationwide. Uh, next slide. Again, this is uh, another kind of the same thing. Some people are visual and like to see pies. This is basically to give you a breakdown of all the FTA programs that we have nationwide. And as you can see, a huge increase Basically, we have two parts of money, the formula of money that everybody gets uh, based on population and mileage and all those things. 
And then the second one is the uh, discretionary program that I will be discussing in more detail. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, just to give you what are the FDA priorities uh, for implementation, and this is as it relates to the DOT priorities. And as you can see, we have the four um, main priorities, obviously safety. We wanna provide safety uh, service to our transit, public transit. We wanna modernize all the uh, existing uh, you know, programs nationwide to have a good repair uh, on the nation's transit system. The third one is climate. And we have a set of new programs that will address climate change uh, as, as we move forward with uh, low emission or electric buses and you know programs like that. And then the last one is really important. We wanna make sure that everybody has a, a, a chance to benefit for all these transit programs. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is what we call the competitive grant programs. You know, unfortunately you have to compete with your neighbor, but again, there's a huge increase uh, throughout the country. The first two, which I won't really talk too much about, is really for the, what we call the legacy transit agencies in the country. They're gonna be able to, uh, enhance their facilities. Uh, the second one is also for the legacy agencies is the Royal Vehicle Replacement Grants, especially for those agencies that have vehicles and trains that have been around for you know, 50, 60 years. Now the last two, those are more uh, beneficial for you eventually. Uh, the, the, the next one is uh, what we call the ferry service for rural communities. So it's about a billion dollars nationwide. And then the second one is the electric or low emitting ferry pilot program. Again, these two are programs that we are working on the criteria to be released soon. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, again, these are more discretionary grants. I, I wanna discuss the first two that will be to your benefit. The first one is the what we call the low or no emission vehicle competitive grant program. This program has been around in FTA for many years. As you can see, we probably double or triple the federal funding nationwide. And the second one is, again, uh, is this one really addresses, you know, regular buses. They don't have to be low emission, but also will give you the opportunity to apply for you know, if you want buses, obviously you need a maintenance facility to maintain those buses. So that's what the program is about. And I'll go into more detail on the next slide. Okay, uh, again, uh, this is just to give you a, a flavor. As you, as you know, in, in the FDA programs, uh, you get the, the federal annual appropriations uh, about Two months ago, we released the partial apportionment, and now that we have a full funding from Congress, uh, you will be getting the full appropriations in the next couple of months. And I don't have the, the amounts for each territory, but in essence, you will be getting almost uh, the double annual appropriations for your regular FDA programs. And then the last two are the, uh, the new uh, NOFO opportunities. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so in a little more detail, what do these programs really are trying to address? And so just to give you a, a quick definition, the one on the left is the, what we call the loan out program. Basically, if you want to acquire low emission buses for your transit facilities. And then the, the one on the right is the traditional bus and, bus and bus facilities program. And I do recall uh, CNMI got a grant maybe a couple of years ago. They were very successful in getting a competitive program. So what are we doing this year is we're gonna combine the enough opportunity into one application. So you will have the opportunity to apply for either program or for both. And let's go to the next slide, I'll give you more information. Okay, this is just to give you a breakdown on the funding. And we just released the NOFO about, you know, three weeks ago, the applications will be due on May 31st. And then there will be, as usual, there's gonna be an evaluation technical team that will go over the applications and so forth. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Again, uh, 
This is an important slide, not only for the FDA programs, for all the federal programs. If there's anything as a takeaway, please pay attention to this one. This is the what we call the Justice 40 initiative. What this addresses is to make sure that uh, folks will have the opportunity to apply for funding. And this is because if you fall under what we call communities uh, with, with needs or territories, you're going to be able to identify yourself as a community that has been historically disadvantaged. And then you will put that in your application and you have a much better chance to, you know, hopefully to get an award. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, this is just some uh, information for you. We have our website. We keep that updated on a daily basis. There will be opportunities for webinars, uh, town hall meetings, uh, and things like that. Region 9 is also trying to sponsor the different upcoming uh, webinars tailored specifically for you guys uh, on the Pacific uh, territories. Uh, the next slide, I think it's going to give you additional information, FTA resources, website links to keep you aware of all the FTA programs. Uh, next slide. Okay, and that's all. I'll be available this afternoon and Ryan will be available to discuss any upcoming FTA programs. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Our next speaker will be Katie from uh, FEMA. Oh, Great. I catch you off guard. You did. <laughs> in front of me. So we're, we're almost right on schedule and I appreciate all the, the speakers for, for doing that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, fire away. All right, great. Still just waiting for my slides to come up, but but no problem here. Hi there, my name is Katie Lipiecki. I'm the Mitigation Division Director with FEMA Region 9. Um, like some of our other partners, our regional uh, territory or area of operation encompasses Arizona, California, and Nevada, but then obviously our Pacific um, territories and Hawaii as well. Just give me one second while I pull up my notes here. Alrighty. Well, while we're waiting for the slide, I'll just I'll just dive in here. So within FEMA, our mission is is really pretty simple, but I think it's broad in scope. Um, it's basically to help people before, during, and after disasters. And I'm here to speak a little bit about some of our hazard mitigation grant programs where we achieve some of those objectives. Um, FEMA does not have VIL funding, but we do have other sources of funding available for infrastructure projects. And um, I've selected a, a few to highlight um, here this afternoon. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so the, the one that hopefully some of you have heard of is our BRIC grant or Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities, which will be detailed. Here we go on, the, on this slide. Um, this is a, a program that's relatively new, but one that we are quite excited about. Um, this is a program that aims to shift a lot of the, the funding for mitigation projects from the post-disaster environment and shifting it to pre-disaster so that we're really you know, be, being able to mitigate before the damage occurs and having more resilient communities and structures as well. Um, it's a it's an opportunity to have some some really proactive mitigation investment in our, in our communities. Um, so this program, uh, some of the, the priorities include um, encouraging large scale public infrastructure projects, uh, increasing uh, the numbers of projects that are going to be mitigating risk to one or more lifelines. Lifelines include things like water, power, energy, uh, transportation, things that I've already heard are priorities from some of our, our territory partners here. Um, also really focusing on promoting projects to incorporate nature-based solutions. I'm shifting away from, from some of the, the harder structures and into more um, uh, nature-based solutions that, that are um, complementary to some of the climate change um, strategies that many of you have in place. And then also, you know, incentivizing um, the adoption and the enforcement of disaster resilient modern building code. Um, having a modern building code in place um, saves $11 for every $1 um, in mitigation, and, or vice, reverse that, saves $11 for every $1 um, that is spent in federal disaster dollars. And so it really is an effective way um, to, to see real mitigation and, and resilient communities in place. 
so this program is, I mentioned new and a little different. We did have a pre-disaster mitigation program or PDM, but the funding was relatively low and, and relatively inconsistent. So this program is a commitment um, and it is funded through a 6% set aside from um, uh, post-disaster grant funding. And so there, there is going to be a more consistent um, funding infusion in this program. Um, for the first fiscal year of this program, the FY20 program, there was $500 million nationally allocated for this program. Year two of FY21, $1 billion were available. I know that seems like a drop in the bucket compared to some of the funding that some of our partners have, have identified so far, but this truly is an historic investment in mitigation that we haven't seen before. And so it really is quite exciting. Um, alrighty, um, yes, the next slide, please. All right, so some of the other programs that we have, you know, I mentioned the, the, the pre-disaster mitigation grant program, BRIC. We also have disaster grants that do also supply um, funding for um, infrastructure projects. Our hazard mitigation grant program and hazard mitigation grant program post-fire um, are um, uh, important pro uh, programs that do help to strengthen um, our, our resiliency post-disaster, aiming to buy down risk um, and, and really help build uh, some preparedness across the country. So some of the eligible activities that I'll get into are very, very similar from the pre-disaster mitigation program to the post-disaster mitigation program. Um, there is one that I wanted to make sure that I mention, um, and it is the, uh, the STORM Act, or the Safeguarding Tomorrow Through Ongoing Risk Mitigation. Um, this is a new uh, program um, it authorizes FEMA to provide capitalization grants to establish revolving loan funds um, to provide hazard mitigation assistance to local governments to reduce risks from hazards and disasters. So the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, um, was, became law on November 15th of 2021. Um, this fully funded the STORM Act um, and will be providing $500 million or $100 million per year over five years in funding. So this act is going to be modeled after EPA's Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking uh, Water Act. It's a revolving loan program again. Um, and uh, yeah, so those programs partially fund water infrastructure projects. So it's similarly, the Storm Act will partially fund um, mitigation um, projects. Two One minutes, thing Katie. Oh, thank you. One thing I really want to highlight though, this is a new program. We are in the very initial phases of program design, um, which include discussions surrounding when and how to engage internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. So over the coming months, um, as we move through this process, this process, we're gonna be providing additional information through our regular communication channels. So stay tuned there. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep you guys posted. Next slide, please. Eligibility. Um, so, you know, I mentioned the STORM Act is, is relatively new. We're working through um, um, elig eligibility for that, but for BRIC and for HMGP, um, territories are eligible to apply for those. Um, HM, uh, the, the BRIC program um, is uh, released through the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which we're anticipating coming out in the spring. Um, and what, what can you do now? Well, you can start talking to your territory hazard mitigation officer. Um, these programs are, are administered through the, the Territory uh, uh, Hazard Mitigation Officer, and those are the folks who I think are the, the best uh, first line of defense to help identify if there are uh, possibilities or opportunities um, to mitigate some of the infrastructure projects that I've, I've heard uh, addressed so far. And I've just listed some of the eligible activities. There's a full listing of what's eligible on the HMA guidance document. Um, but uh, here we go is a, 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 um, a, a sliver of what some of those funding opportunities are. And I'm available during the, um, the uh, sessions later uh, over the course of the next two days if you have any questions or want to learn more about these programs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Okay, um, the next presentation will be... Don, I was going to um, see if Herb Tweet is in the room from EDA. Oh. Um, because he was going to present next from EDA. Uh, okay, um, so we have two EDA folks uh, virtually, so we can go to Army Corps right now, and then I'll make sure that they're ready to go after you're done. Does that work? Sound, sounds good. So, so the next hour and 45 minutes will be devoted to the Army Corps. No. <laughs> 
we'll have a, a quick presentation. We don't bring any uh, really much of any money to the table, but we do bring uh, some some support and expertise, which we wanted to go over. So with that, Rhiannon Kurtowski, who's the uh, uh, chief of civil works for uh, the Honolulu district and my boss. <laughs> Talofa Hafade and aloha, everybody. Uh, I am Rhiannon Kucharski. I am the Chief of Civil and Public Works for Honolulu District of the Corps of Engineers. I am also our legislative liaison, and it's an honor to be here today. Thank you to the organizers and to the participants. Um, hopefully my slides are coming up shortly. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully um, you are a little bit familiar with the Corps, and if not, that's okay. I'm gonna give you a, a whirlwind tour or overview of our agency and what we can do for you. And then please come see myself and my colleagues at our office hours today. So if you were here from the Corps of Engineers, could you please raise your hand so everyone can see you? Thanks everybody. All right, so if you can go to the next slide, please. This is a quick overview of what we're gonna to touch on today and some beautiful pictures related to three watershed studies that are ongoing right now that we're doing with each of the three territories in the Pacific. Next slide, please. So the Honolulu District's area of responsibility encompasses 12 million square miles, five time zones, two congressional districts, and three U.S. territories. Our home office is here on Oahu at Fort Shafter. We do have forward offices in Guam um, and American Samoa. Next slide, please. So our district has just over 300 employees with capabilities that range from planning, engineering, design, contracting, construction, real estate, and operations and maintenance. And those uh, functions fall within these following missions and include reach back capability to technical expertise and resources across the Corps of Engineers. So we assist federal resource agencies directly as partners when asked. We also assist local government agencies and so today I'm going to touch on civil works, our regulatory mission, and interagency and international service function. Next slide, please. So the Corps coordinates, collaborates, and partners with many federal, state, and local agencies, as well as nonprofit organizations and its water resources. If you have partnered with us in your career in some way or another, can you raise your hand? Awesome. That's really exciting. So, you know, just a few of the folks that we're working with in the territories and other collaborators, like the Office of Insular Affairs, are listed there. And I am very excited about the funding that we just got for the OFU airstrip, pictured in the lower right-hand corner. Next slide, please. So, we're very different than our federal partners. Some may even call us weird, and that's okay. We don't grant funding. We don't loan funding. What we do is partner with you directly, usually on a cost shared basis. The territories do have a cost share waiver that they can avail themselves of, um, or we can actually work for you in a cost reimbursable basis. So I'm going to touch really quickly on some of the categories in which we can assist. So we can conduct feasibility studies, we can conduct watershed studies, and we can offer technical assistance to you uh, among a whole host of broad categories. Next slide, please. Our civil works priority missions include navigation, flood risk management, coastal storm risk management, ecosystem restoration and watershed planning. Uh, we can help with specifically authorized projects. We have a continuing authorities program. That program was a main beneficiary of the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. In fact, every project that our district had requested under CAP was just funded to begin um, under that act. So there are a lot of opportunities there from these increases in the funding pots. Uh, we can also give planning assistance to states and territories, offer floodplain management services, and help with flood and coastal emergencies. Next slide, please. So another key area in which we can support is interagency and international services. This is technical assistance on a cost reimbursable basis. So if you are a federal partner, um, for example, Office of Insular Affairs, you can partner with us directly underneath a memorandum of agreement. Um, if you are a local territorial government, you can also partner with us. In fact, we just signed an agreement with Guam um, under this program. And so under this, we can help you with planning, design and construction, environmental support, and many other areas. And that again is on a cost reimbursable basis. So if you get federal funding 
under say bill then and you need help uh, implementing what you plan to do with that funding you can approach us and we can see if this program might be right for us to assist next slide please we also have a regulatory or permitting function in the Corps of Engineers, not under my branch, but under another. Under that, um, we work under the Clean Water Act, Section 404, Rivers and Harbors Act, Section 10, and the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act, Section 103, to help with permitting. Um, and I do have a contact for my colleague at the end slide in case you need permitting support. Next slide, please. So there you'll see my contact information, Linda Spearstra, who is our Chief of Regulatory, and also Dave Griffin, my colleague, who is our Chief of Environmental. I hope you'll come see us at the office hours, and please reach out if you ever think you might need us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rhiannon, and right on time. We're doing good. Uh, do we have someone on online? We do. Um, could you, could so, you hear me? Yeah, uh, online. Can you hear me? This will, is Francis. Um, queue up Francis and Kara Lee. All right. And Francis and Kara Lee, let us know if you'd like us to share your slides or if you'd like to share your screen. Uh, can you hear me at all? Yes, we can. You could. Okay, everybody. All right. Um, and if you can queue up the slides and I can just say next sure. slide, would that work? Yeah, that works great. Just okay. give us one minute to pull them up. Okay, we've got the slides up here. Oh, hold on. Okay, I'm not seeing it. I mean, I can pull it up on my computer, but I'm... Um, We're almost there. Just one more minute. Nope, wrong one. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Thank you. Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you um, to the Office of Insular Affairs for inviting EDA. Um, I was hoping um, our Hawaii and Pacific Island colleague in EDR, Herb Tweet, um, was going to be there. Um, and uh, and maybe he'll be there for the networking session. Myself and Carolee Wenworth, we are on the mainland. Um, and so, I, although I'm well, we both would love to be in Hawaii, but uh, we're, we're stuck out here. So um, I've got some slides here, and it's basically just some general information on, on EDA. Um, so we'll just go ahead and go through that. So my name is Frances Sakaguchi. I am the uh, what we call the Regional Economic Development Integrator, and I'm out of the, the Region 10 office. Uh, which is the Western States, and it covers also the Hawaii and the Pacific Islands as well. Um, for most of you, are probably familiar with EDA, um, but if if you're not, I mean, our entire mission is to do economic development work, um, and so we lead the the federal agency in that process. Um, uh, we lead the economic development agenda, and we do promote the innovation, competitiveness. And we are all about um, economic capacity building um, and job growth. Um, we definitely want to get, get new jobs out there. How we do that is we are pretty much a grant funding agency. Um, we have a lot of grants um, and we have one revolving loan fund. Uh, and I'll, I'll go over some of the grants really quick on the next page, but I put down integration here because that's what I do. And, the, and obviously there's a lot of federal agencies here. And actually this is great for me because I'm learning about their programs as well. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, how can we work with our federal agencies to be able to help you all in the community in the islands? How can we help you all by combining our efforts? So. Um, and that's a, so the integration work is a, a really important part of, of our work. So um, that is included on here. So if we go on to the next slide. So again, being a grant funding agency, um, we have a lot of different grant programs. I'm going to go over pretty much just the general programs that we have every year. Um, and, and then just talk just very briefly about some of these, um, the supplemental fundings. Uh, and the one thing about EDA is we are a very flexible agency in terms of what we can fund. 
um, in, in terms of different types of projects and and the the various um, and, and build infrastructure. I mean, we can if there's something that fits where we can do it, whether it's on transportation or whether it, it's it's um, I mean, there were some you know, airport type projects. There were these different kind of projects that you all had out there, projects that uh, were supporting some of the coastal resilience issues. I mean, if it ties to economic development, there are possibilities that EDA can fund um, a potential project that, that fits that. So we do have planning funds, uh, very limited, but we do have planning funds. Uh, local technical assistance is um, funds such as funding uh, studies, um, and you said including university centers. We have a university center program, which is a technical assistance program that we fund universities and the universities can provide uh, technical assistance, which could include research and data. Um, but again, these are things that we can potentially fund. Um, the one revolving loan fund uh, that is for small businesses, entrepreneurship, public works is more on the facility type of funding um, and uh, uh, the economic adjustment assistance, that's the bucket where any of the other things, the planning, the local technical assistance, you know, feasibility studies, the uh, uh, planning and design, uh, the facilities development, um, equipment purchase, those can fall under economic adjustment assistance. It's kind of like the, the overall. But also within that, we put our supplemental funding and those are like the big fundings that come in. Uh, most recently, uh, the CARES Act, and then currently the ARPA funding, the American Rescue Plan funding. For those of you that are out in the islands, you probably have received a lot of um, assistance from EDA from the disaster supplementals. And that's the funding uh, that doesn't always come in, but sometimes comes in. I mean, after a major disaster, declared disaster, it comes in uh, and for like the typhoons, the hurricanes, uh, the uh, volcano, um, and I guess the earthquake as well. We've offered assistance in that. Yeah. And so that uh, that's those are good sums of money that EDA gets. And again, I know a lot of the projects out there in the islands have, have been assisted by that. We also have some additional funds. Fr Francis, we've got just two minutes left. OK, no, um, I can get this through quick. The additional funds are, are um, programs are set up by headquarters and uh, I just listed them there and uh, so you can there's a link down below on this page can I uh, we and just click we did not receive any funding in this bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill so uh, our regular programs has to be able to supplement any of the other types of funding you get uh, from the other agencies next slide please hi Francis Francis this is Carolee oh, can Carole, I chime yeah, in wanna, just sure. to add on that Sure. So my name is Carolee Winderoff and I'm the Tribal Engagement Coordinator and I just want to tie into what Francis is describing with the programs we have available. Although we didn't receive anything from the infrastructure bill directly, we have a number of programs that are designed to support the infrastructure bill to leverage the resources. If you find gaps in areas where you're not finding funding, please look at EDA to see if there's any way that we can leverage the resources to help you complete a project. Um, and we do have a website, um, eda.gov backslash contact, where you can find your regional economic development representative to help guide the projects and the funding that we have available. Go ahead, Francis. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Carolee. Um, and just again, very quickly, um, these are just some of the uh, entities that are eligible for our funding. Um, pretty much public entities, Institute of Higher Ed, nonprofits. Um, next slide, please. Uh, planning, uh, we do require a planning document to be eligible for our funding. We call it a comprehensive economic development strategy or equivalent to that, pretty much a long range planning strategy. I think most of the states and territories do have one uh, and, and you can update that if you have a project that's not in there. Um, matching requirement, uh, it depends on uh, the distress level and tribes um, eligible up to 100%. Next slide, please. I hear the beeping. There's two more slides, I know that. <laughs> These are our funding priorities. The more priorities you can meet, um, and then the uh, more competitive you are. Equity is number one right now. A lot of the agencies have already covered that, but you see that we do recovery resilience, workforce development, environmental sustainable development, a lot of things that, that you all um, have, the projects that, that might fit um, with your needs. And then the last slide should be our contact. Next slide. 
and this is our contact information. The two island uh, contacts out there are the, uh, her tweet on the Pacific side, Juan Baza, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands. There's Carol Lee's contact and my contact and then some links to the website. So thank you. Um, and uh, um, you know, be sure to reach out to, to us if you need any further information. Well, thank you very much for all the federal partners and the Commonwealth and the territories. And uh, um, please make sure that that uh, it, uh, you come back for the, um, the office hours session in, in just 90 minutes or thereabouts. And we can we'll go into more detail for each and every uh, uh, project. Over. Terrific. Thank you so much. What a great, great panel. Appreciate it. Um, we're now switching over to broadband um, and we'll be inviting up uh, those who are presenting as part of this. Oh, 